Good morning, and we're going we're gonna to pick up this morning at uh, verse 5 of John chapter 17. We kind of left off last week. I want to preface it with a remark or two. That song was perfect, by the way, in the introduction, speaking of uh, the glory to God and God alone. Uh, people inherently try to give glory to people whether it be politicians, whether it be sports figures, uh, movie stars. We tend to want to look at a human being and elevate them. We even do it sometimes to pastors and Christian leaders. And I just want to say, as we go into John 17, that you, you pay particular attention to the word glory. Uh, if anybody knew who was supposed to give glory, I guess it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he prays in this John 17 to his Father, giving him the glory, although, albeit Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God. You'll notice that he gave the glory to his Father. The Templar Knights in the Middle Ages were sent by the Pope to Israel to protect the highway from Caesarea on the coast to Jerusalem. Pilgrims were going there to go to the holy sites of Jerusalem, and they were being molested and robbed, and worse, by bandits on that highway. And so the Templar Knights were sent to uh, protect that highway and protect Christian people. And I've always been moved. They were fierce warriors, by the way, a very storied group, but they they selected Psalms 115, verse 1, as their motto. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be all the glory. And I wish you'd keep that in mind as we, as we look this morning. Remember, as we go through this, this is the prayer of Jesus Christ, the night before the crucifixion, to his heavenly Father. In verse 5, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Well, that'll do something for your theology right there if you camp out on that verse, won't it? People out there in the world say, Jesus never said he was God. They've never read the New Testament when they say that. Well, let's go on. I want to point out to you, Jesus says, Ask his father to bring him back up to heaven and let him experience the glory that he had before the world existed. Notice, before the world existed. That is before creation. That's before Genesis 1-1. That's before the universe of space and time that we experience now ever existed. Aeons past, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, were in eternity experiencing glory with one another. So we've got, we've got here a testimony from Jesus that he existed, that he was pre-existent, uh, and that he was divine, that he was God himself. And he's asking his heavenly father to look down to him as a, a man. He's taken on the form of a man, become a man, he didn't take on the form of a man. He became a man. I have to watch myself here. He is walking a dusty road from the Temple Mount to the Garden of Gethsemane to spend that night in prayer. And imagine he is God Almighty. And he's praying to his Heavenly Father to take him back, to bring him back to heaven where he experienced glory before you know, are you familiar with Philippians 2? I hope you are. It's a very uh, uh, moving passage of Scripture where it talks about that, that uh, Jesus being in the form of God uh, did not think it was a, a thing uh, to hold on to, but he emptied himself, right? And he, he condescended himself, and he became a man. He took on flesh, right? You know that passage, I think. Uh, 
one of the things that's happened over the history of church is people have read that passage and they've interpreted it wrong. They have gone to the extreme to say that Jesus, I prefer to use the word Christ before uh, Bethlehem. Uh, he became Jesus when he was born, but Christ emptied himself. And the question is, what did he empty himself of? Mm. And some erroneously have said he emptied himself of being God. He was just a, an all-out pure man, a human being when he was here. And I believe that's error. That's not correct theology. I believe that what he emptied himself of was his glory, if you will, to his divine prerogatives. He became a man in every sense of the word. He allowed himself to be put in a situation of vulnerability like all of us are, right? Amen. We've got Christian brothers and sisters in some parts of the world that are being tortured, imprisoned, starved, and killed, right? There's persecution that happens in our world today. We are vulnerable to, uh, to evil in this world, and that's what Jesus did. He left that glory, that divine prerogative, that power, and omniscience to say that I am going to literally become a man. I'll have a divine nature, and I will have a human nature, and I will live among people. And that's what he's asking his father for here in this verse. He's asking for his father to bring him back to glory, to, to his divine rights, his prerogatives, to be the son of God in glory. Just looking at verse 5, very simply, I want to make a few statements. It's a very short verse. It's a very clear verse. But there is so much truth that comes out of that verse. Number one, that the one praying had been in existence before the world ever existed. That's clear from that verse. Yeah. Number two, that although he was the son of God, he's praying to his father as the son, even though he was the son of God, at the time he prayed this prayer, he was not in glory. I think we can all agree with that. The night before crucifixion. Number three, it's clear that at some point that Jesus Christ laid aside his glory, that he intentionally laid it down in order to come here and live among us. Amen. And number four, He's asking the Father that in light of the fact that he's done everything the Father sent him here for on a mission, that he had completed the work and he was asking that he could resume the glory that he had before the world existed. I think that's an incredible statement, that verse. Very short, but very clear. Now, we turn a corner in John 17 when we go to verse 6. In the first five verses, Jesus prayed for himself. In the next, uh, well, it's verses 6 through 19, Jesus is going to pray for his disciples, not just the 11, but also those that would come to be disciples over the course of human history. Therefore, it would include you. And this prayer definitely includes us. Here it is, verse 6. Father, I have manifested your name to the people whom you've given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Got three truth statements there. I want to emphasize a doctrine right here, if I may, a truth. Something that you're going to find when you read the New Testament. And that is the doctrine that's called formally election. That God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. That God has called us and given us to the Son of God in order that we might be saved. Yes, sir. That's what election is. I think I, I can't remember, I think I touched on this last week a little bit. Uh, 
the election of God is something that rattles the bones of many Christian people. Hmm. It's something that uh, when you talk about predestination, foreordained, foreknowledge, all these things, they just really rattle some people because they've got an inflated concept of their ego. They want to say, I did it. I found Jesus. I chose Jesus. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Well, you know, all of those things are true, those statements I just rattled off, but there's a bigger truth, and that is election, is that God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen. Now, that is what we call a paradox. A paradox. We've got two things that are true, and they appear to conflict with each other, don't they? And yet, even though election is taught to us here, look, notice this, Father, you gave those people to who? To Jesus. You gave them to me. They were yours, and now they're mine. And all these people he's talking about, that's us. That's election. It's there. Deal with it. I can't explain it, how those two go together, and I, I'm fine with that. I'm comfortable with that. Anybody that tells you they can, you better beware. You better step back. Uh, let me point out to you this thing of election in this chapter we're studying right here. We'll go over this in the, uh, today and next week too. But notice this. I'm going to give you some, give you some emphasis. Verse two of this chapter. Jesus says to the Father, to as many as you have given him, the Son. Verse six that we just talked about, unto the men which you gave me, and you gave them to me. Yeah. Verse nine, for them which you have given me. Verse 11, whom you have given me. Verse 12, for those that you gave to me. Friends, uh, what I've just read to you are examples of election. And I, I, I believe that they're true, and I believe that, uh, that it's also true that uh, those that the Father's given to Jesus will have three things that happen. Number one, God gives them to Jesus. Number two, the Holy Spirit draws those people to yes. Jesus. I believe that the Holy Spirit in this lifetime that we're living, he's the one that draws us, he convicts us of our sin. He's the one that, that uh, when we're hearing the gospel preached or, or uh, we're hearing the gospel shared with us by somebody, mom or dad or a friend, that we, it's the Holy Spirit that opens up our heart and illumines us to know that's true. Yeah. And number three, and this is where the paradox come in, they have to receive Jesus and believe on his name in order to be saved. There's nowhere in the scripture where it says that these verses of election where God's given people to Jesus, that it ever denies that people are responsible to make a decision for the salvation of their souls. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, watch this, that whosoever believes on him, right? 1 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that anybody should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. Yes. That's human responsibility, isn't it? That's an example of people have got to decide yes to the gospel, right? And yet, we've got these verses of election telling us that before Earl ever made the decision to tell Jesus he wanted to be saved, that God was working in Earl's life, giving him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He was elected. 
and he believed it. And it completes those are two contradictory statements. And friends, I will defer to all of you to the day we get to heaven and you can ask that question that somebody knows better than I do. They're true. And it's okay that you don't understand how they fit together. They're just true. Verse 7, now, talking about the disciples, Father, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Verse 8, for I have given them the words that you gave me. Yes. And they have received them, and they've come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Notice, notice Jesus, in talking to his Father, reveals to us the reason he spent three years with those, those 12 disciples. What did he give them? Did he give them cars, houses, and money? Did he give them jobs? Did he give them wealth and fame? No. What he said was, I, Father, I gave them your word. Now, as Baptist people, <clears throat> we are often called the people of the book. The Baptists have a long history of the formation of the Word of God in written form and being distributed to put in the laps of common folks like us. We're the ones that did it. When the hierarchy of the Middle Ages didn't want people to have the Bible, didn't want people to read the Bible in their own language. The Baptists fought that, and they've made it possible today for us to own the Bible in our home and read it at will. That is what Jesus gave to the disciples. The words of the fathers, the way he import, the way he expresses it. Number two, he says, Father, now these disciples of mine, they know who you are, and they know who I am, and they know that you sent me here. Yes, sir. Now, these disciples, I know you know your gospels and all the stories about these, these characters. And uh, it's kind of uh, almost amusing to read the Gospels, to read the way they fumbled along, walking right in the presence of the Son of God. You'd think that it would all have been easy and they would have gotten it right off the bat, but they didn't. Uh, they, were, they were just like us, and uh, they're to be forgiven for that, I believe. They got there eventually, <laughs> didn't they? But Jesus had given these guys the words of the Father. Words that have been codified, inspired, written down in the Word of God that we carry with us. That's where it all came from. It came from the Father to Jesus, who shared it with the apostles, and we now have it in our scriptures. Verse 9, I'm praying for him, Father. I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you've given me, for they are yours. Does that surprise you, that he doesn't pray for the world? Did you know that? He's not doing it now. Does that shock you? you disagree? Y'all are awful quiet this morning. <laughs> Jesus Christ is not praying for the world. He died for the world. Yes. He has done everything that could be done for a lost person to be saved. There is nothing more that he could do than what he has done. Notice who he's praying for. He's praying for you. He's praying for you. The book of Hebrews has got a verse in it that I love, and it'll change your view when you pray, when you think about what's going on when you pray. Hebrews says, Jesus lives forever interceding for us. Yes. He ever lives to intercede for us. And what does that say? Well, you all know that Jesus is divine, right? He's mortal. He's always been and he always will be. Ever lives, forever lives. But here's the important thing that a lot of people miss. What's he doing right now? He's praying for you. Yes. Now you might think of uh, when you pray, you might close your eyes 
and you might uh, visualize in your mind, I don't know how it is for you, you try to calmly come into God's presence and give him praise and give him adoration before you ask for anything. Uh, whether you visualize anything uh, in regards to Jesus or the Father while well, you're praying, I don't know. Some of you probably do, some of you probably don't. But I want to say to you that the, the, the picture that you should have in your heart and in your mind when you bow your head and close your eyes and begin to pray is that you're talking to somebody who lives forever and at the same time that you're praying, he's praying for you. Yes, yes. He's at the right hand of his father. Must be a glorious looking thing to see the throne of God up there. Father's up there on the throne. Jesus is at his right hand. But he is praying for us while he's there. He's doing it today. He's been doing it since you were born. He will do it to the day you die. He's praying for you. Verse 10, all of mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Let me elaborate on that just, if I may. All of my disciples belong to you, Father. They came from you. And all of your disciples, Father, are mine because you gave them to me. And these disciples, all of them, the 12, as well as you, folks here this morning, he says, I am glorified in all of them. All right? That's why I started this morning talking about glory. It's, uh, it's a dangerous thing to try to take the glory that belongs to God the Father. People do that. And it's, uh, it's something we need always to be cautious of. God is the only one worthy of glory. Amen. Not us. And here in this uh, verse 10, Jesus has given us something that, that ought to change your life. It ought to really encourage you. And that is to know that you bring glory to God. Your Christian life, your testimony, your love for the Lord, your, your prayer life, all of these things that we all practice, that brings glory to Him. It shines upon Him. It magnifies Him. It makes Him known. It's to make God known Amen. is what glory is. Now, verse 11, And I'm no longer in the world, Father, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name which you've given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Uh, I am no longer in the world. Is, is that, does that bother your mind? He's walking down the road to Gethsemane, and he's praying and he told the Father, I'm not in the world anymore. Isn't that interesting? You know what it is? As God, he's talking in the future tense what is already, I mean, he's, yeah. he's in the present tense, but he's talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, all being in the past. He sees the past, the present, and the future. I am no longer in the world. Well, I guess technically you could say, yes, Jesus, you are, but it's so true that tomorrow, you're going to die for my sins. And God's going to raise you from the dead in three days. A little bit after that, he's going to lift you up into heaven to his glory. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Let me read for you Acts 1, 9 through 11. It takes place a little later than this day right here. It says, Jesus is up there with his Mount of Olives with his disciples, and it and when he had said these things to the disciples, as they were all looking at him, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. That's what Jesus is seeing in verse 11. It's coming. He's going to die on that cross, be raised from the dead, spend a few days getting his disciples oriented, and then he's going to be ascending up into heaven, back to the glory. He asked the Father in this verse, and think of yourself when you hear this, Father, keep through your name those that you've given to me. Now when he says your name, uh, something we need to talk about. Jewish people, when they say your name, they're not just talking about your name. They, Jim. That's not what they're, that's not how the Jewish mind thinks. At the same time that they say your name, whatever it might be, fill in the blank, they are calling out, describing, bringing up to the surface who you are, your character, your, your personality, your being, everything about you. That's why when it says, those that trust in your name in the book of Psalms will have character. No, it's, it's not because you know the name of Jesus. It's when you know his name, when his nature, his personality is known to you when you are in, indwelt by the Spirit of God and you know who Jesus is. That's what it's talking about here. Father, keep them through your name, Yahweh, Jehovah, yes, but more than that, all of God's ways, all of his commandments, all of his word, keep them through that, Lord. That's how we get kept. I want to point out something that ought to be a comfort to you. I know that you made a decision to get up this morning and get dressed and come to church. I did too. And that's true. All of that's true. But I also want to say to you that you're wanting to get up this morning and get dressed and go to church is because of the work of the Heavenly Father keeping you. He keeps us. It's not all just ourselves. Sure, we've got a large part of our responsibilities to get up and do the right thing on Sunday morning. We all, we all know that. It's true. But the scriptures always insist upon the fact that our Father is actively involved in keeping you keeping you. You could use the word guarding you if you like. Yes. You are kept. You are guarded by the Heavenly Father. And that's what he says. And he says that they might be one Father, these disciples, even as we are. Now, there's two or three verses in this chapter that have been grossly misinterpreted over the years. I want to speak to that just a minute, if I may. This little phrase right here uh, is one of them. He's saying to the Father, he wants all Christians to be one, even as we are. Now, people are people. They can't help it. And when they read that, those that are reading that with a wrong perception have gotten this wrong. He's not asking that there only be one denomination. Christians in the world. He's not asking for an ecumenical church, if you know what that is. He is not asking for some sort of hierarchy or organization to be formed and incorporated in the state of Texas that all Christians have to go to. That's not what he's talking about. Notice he said that there'll be one like we are, Father, Father and Son. What is, how are they one? Well, besides being one in essence, 
They are totally one in their submission to the will of God. Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my Father. The work that I do, it's not my work. It's the work of my Father. The words that I share to you, it's not my words. It's the words of my Father. That's how he was one with his Father while on earth here. And what he's talking about is for people that love him, that are his disciples, that they would be one like he is with his Father. The work we do, the mission that we do, the words that we use should be the words of the Heavenly Father, the words that Jesus Christ has given to us. Now, it also means that we're to love our brothers and sisters. Amen. No matter what church they go to. If they are a born again Christian, we're to love them. We're not in competition with the Methodists, the Presbyterians. If they are our brothers and sisters, we're to be one with them, one family. We're to cooperate with them. That all of that's true. I don't want you to hear me wrong on this this morning. We don't need to feel threatened by other churches or other denominations. Those are just folks that, that believe something a little different than we do, and so they've got their own church. It's okay. And they're, they're not making us violate what Jesus says here about being one. Do you love them? Yes. Do you bless them? Can you pray for them, for their success? That's what being one is, just like the Father says. Verse 12, while I was with them, Father, I kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that scripture might be fulfilled. Boy, howdy. Once again, notice that you are kept, all right? You're not on your own out there. You don't have to muster up the Christian life. Jesus is saying, once again, Father, I am keeping them. I'm, I'm guarding them. I'm taking care of them, Father, in your name. He says not one of the disciples that God has given to the Son have been lost. <clears throat> I want to underline that. It needs to be said that once you are saved, you cannot be lost. You cannot be lost. For many reasons, and we're not going to go into them all here, but understanding the election that the Father, before the foundation of the world, gave you to the Son, number two, that the Son has been revealed to you, the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has been revealed, and you believed and you received the Lord Jesus Christ. You have completed the election, and you will never be lost. Yeah. <clears throat> because at that point, as this verse says, it's up to Jesus right then to keep you. It's yes. not up to you anymore. You are kept by the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now let's talk about the son of perdition real quickly. we got to go. The son of perdition, the son of destruction. Obviously, that's talking about Jesus. We know what happened there. This phrase, son of destruction, is only used one other time in the Bible. Here it is. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Who's that talking about? You know? That's the Antichrist that's coming. Well, Judas Iscariot is compared to the Antichrist, the son of destruction. It means son of destruction in the original Greek, one who is destined to be lost. It's a, it's a word play, if you will. It means no one is lost except the one destined to be lost. Psalms 41.9 even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. In other words, the scripture saying that Jesus was going to lift his heel against Jesus. Now, why? Why Judas? Why did that happen? Why did he bring it up here? 
uh, he, he wanted to say to the Father that he completed the work that he gave him to do. Uh, everyone that God gave him, he's still God. Judas was never given to him by God. He's lost. He wanted to assure all the disciples that that's the way it was so their faith would not be staggered. So they would not whisper among themselves, maybe we're going to be like Jesus someday. No. Some people have used this verse as an example that a believer can lose their salvation. They can be lost again. But if you read it carefully, this verse, you'll understand it's saying just the opposite. Jesus said, none of them is lost but the son of perdition or son of destruction. That shows that Jesus, <laughs> that Judas never was a part of the believing band of disciples. When Jesus uses the word but, that is a word of contrast so, uh, showing that Judas was in another group different from the 11 disciples, right? But in John 17, 11, Jesus plainly told us that he kept everyone that the Father gave him. Since Judas was lost, he could not have been among those who were given to the Son. Mm -hmm. God doesn't make mistakes. Right. And those that belong to him, that have been given to him, the Lord Jesus has never lost one of them. And that's up to today. He never will. All right, my friends, we better stop and go to verse 13 next week. Father, I pray this morning to give you thanks for our study, for John recording it and writing it down for us. I thank you for the great truth that the Holy Spirit has shared through these verses. There's some things here, Lord, that logically we can't figure out and understand. Yet, believing, we understand, Father, that our minds are finite, that your ways are not our ways. We can accept that and trust in that, Lord. We pray and thank you for our salvation. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for guarding us. Lord, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters that are not here with us today. We pray that you keep them healthy and safe. We pray, Father, to ask you to please take this pandemic away from us. Yes. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.